welcome to the latest Reform Scotland pre-election event in partnership with our friends at the Scottish Policy Foundation. My name is Chris Deeran and I'm the Director of Reform Scotland. Today's subject is education uh, and in particular the manifesto published this morning by our Commission on School Reform. It's titled An Education. full of insight, wisdom, policies that the Commission believes would return Scotland to uh, Scotland's education system to world leading status where they to be adopted. If you haven't read it yet, you'll find it on our website at reformscotland.com. I'm going to be quick this afternoon as it's the experts we all want to hear from. All, all I'll say is that Reform Scotland is immensely proud of the Commission on School Reform, which is 10 years old this year. Um, its members come from across the sector from head teachers to directors of education to academics, all of whom give their time free and willingly. Oh, yeah. and we have established the Commission as a rigorous intellectual force and I think as something of a conscience of Scottish education. These are people who have given their lives to education who, who refuse to settle for the status quo or for the political cowardice and obfuscation which too often drives education policy in Scotland, in my view. Um, they are non-partisan and driven by the evidence, the data and the best practice from elsewhere. And that seems to me like a sensible way to run a schools system. Uh, today's panel are all members of the Commission. We'll hear first from Keir Bloomer, its redoubtable chairman, who will outline the manifesto's main content uh, and provide context for its proposals. We'll then hear from Edinburgh University's Professor Lindsay Patterson, arguably the preeminent Scottish academic on the subject of education. Uh, Lindsay will be talking about the attainment gap and the need for an education recovery plan as we emerge from the COVID pandemic. And finally, we'll hear from Helen Chambers, co-founder of the excellent and uh, important charity Inspiring Scotland, who will talk about vocational education and how we might capture those kids for whom a traditional mainstream education simply isn't working. We'll also have a question and answer uh, session towards the end, so please do send your questions to me using the message function on Zoom. You'll see the button on your screen. Just type in your question and send it to me and I'll choose the best ones and ask you to ask them uh, of the panel. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll just remind you to mute if you're not a speaker and uh, hand over to Keir to begin. Keir. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think our manifesto is really rather different from the manifestos of the political parties. Because when talking about education and indeed about a lot of other areas of public life, their manifestos tend to focus on inputs, that they will provide more funding, they will hire more teachers and so forth. Uh, I'm anxious to point out that we're not against hiring more teachers or providing more funding, but frankly that is a very shallow view of what needs to be done. Uh, we need really to think about what the problems are and to come up with solutions which address the problems rather than relying on a belief that if you chuck money the problems will solve themselves. So our uh, proposals start really from an analysis which says that currently Scottish education is not failing but coasting. Lots of people are getting a good education in Scotland, but a fair number are not realising their potential. We are not really achieving either excellence or equity to the degree that we would wish. Uh, there are a lot of separate proposals in our manifesto, so I propose to focus on four areas. The first, and I think arguably the most important, is culture and governance. I say that because I think the shortcomings of Scottish education are not down to teachers. We have a well-trained and well-qualified and well-motivated teaching force. Our problems lie mainly in the way in which the system is run. Uh, it is essentially run by a kind of interlocking clique of elites comprising um, national agencies, a local authority, senior officers, teacher trade unions and so forth, who have been successful to a remarkable and entirely regrettable extent in silencing other voices within the education community. And this has created a culture of compliance and complacency, which really now requires to be urgently addressed. Probably the main proposal that we are putting forward 
is to enhance the degree of decision making at school level. In other words, increasing school autonomy. Uh, we are certainly not unique in taking this view. Uh, you will recall, for example, that a couple of years ago, the present Scottish government actually tabled a bill in Parliament that uh, was proposed to legislate for exactly that. Unfortunately, they withdrew it. Um, our, our commitment is a little bit more serious minded than that. We need legislation and we need it to be backed by a head teacher's charter, which ensures that as many as possible of the critical decisions affecting the school are taken in the school by the people most directly affected by them. At the same time, we suggest that schools require to relate more directly uh, to their community. That's not only uh, the pupils and parents, but the surrounding community, uh, the businesses that they interact with, the voluntary organisations that they have to do with. And we are suggesting, therefore, setting up partnership boards as an intrinsic part of school governance. And we are seeking to ensure that there is dedicated funding available specifically for the purpose of encouraging innovation, because at the present moment, innovation is sadly lacking. Now, all of this, in our view, will encourage diversity in the system. One of the features of Scottish education just now is that it is astonishingly, unhealthily uniform. Uh, a system which is very uniform does not have the capacity to learn from its own experience because its own experience is all much the same. Um, and moving in this direction, empowering schools, taking decision making as far as we can away from the centre will move us in the direction of a healthy depoliticisation of the education process. Second area I want to touch on is curriculum. Um, there's a tendency to talk about curriculum for excellence as though it's 10 years old. It isn't. It's nearly 17 years old now. It originated in the work of a, uh, a curriculum review group, which met during 2003, 2004. And what they produced was essentially a mission statement that set out a limited number of objectives for Scottish education. And those objectives were largely consistent with international thinking on that subject at the time and remain, I think, highly relevant. The problem with Curriculum for Excellence is not the mission statement, but the woeful way in which that has been brought into implementation. It's characterised by a number of negative features, uh, by, for example, simple errors. The narrowing of the curriculum which has taken place in S4, which has seen most Scottish young people no longer able to study for eight qualifications in S4, but rather seven or very commonly six, occasionally five, is really the result of simple error, uh, a failure to understand the guidance that they were themselves issuing. Uh, and on the subject of that guidance, when OECD looked at this aspect of Scottish education uh, six years ago now, uh, it estimated that uh, there was about 20,000 online pages of guidance, much of it low level and inconsequential. It recommended that the message should be clarified and simplified. What actually has happened is that Education Scotland has produced a, a seven slide slideshow which purports to say what Curriculum for Excellence is about, but nothing much has been done about the 20,000 pages. The need for radical simplification and clarification is as great now as it was then. Another feature of Curriculum for Excellence has been that bringing it to the stage that it is now at, unsatisfactory as that is, has called for prodigious efforts on the part of teachers. This initiative has turned out to be another in quite a long line of Scottish initiatives, which have promised much, consumed enormous teacher energy, and at the end of the day, delivered little. I doubt whether there is anyone in Scotland today who believes that this programme has the capacity any longer to bring about transformational change. All of this, I think, is due to the fact 
that Scottish education lacks effective processes of change. Politicians tend to be very interested in stipulating what ought to be happening and show little interest in how that is going to be brought about. And that is a characteristic also of the Curriculum for Excellence programme. There is a confusion of strategy and operational control. Um, no overall direction to the programme at national level, a sorry mixture of higher and lower level advice, and all of this directed by agencies which are characterised by inbuilt problems. I do not blame Education Scotland for the fact that at the heart of its remit lies an irreconcilable conflict of interest. Uh, it is the agency which develops most educational policy and it is the agency which examines its effects through the inspection service. Furthermore, and perhaps even more serious than that, um, it is an agency which has got no, need, no clear customer focus. Its money comes from the government and the government expects it to do as, to, as it is told. Whereas in reality, its real customers are teachers and schools. And until we have a curriculum agency, if we indeed we need one at all, um, which is focused on the needs of its actual customers, we will still suffer from the kind of difficulties that we have experienced up until now. And there are difficulties with the qualifications authority as well, um, which have been very evident throughout the pandemic crisis and remain evident now. Uh, the dispute that is going on, for example, about whether schools should be running quasi exams uh, as part of their assessment process is unresolved. But the, the need that schools perceive for these kind of quasi exams result from SQA's own withdrawal of various of the coursework assessments which were previously part of the arrangements. And we hear also disturbing um, evidence of lack of clarity about uh, what is meant by teacher confidentiality in these circumstances with leaks of information quite extensive. But the most important single thing in relation to the curriculum that we need is a clear educational philosophy which has to be built on the fact that the central purpose of the whole exercise is the acquisition of knowledge. I want to say a little bit about just one aspect of equity, my third topic. Uh, my colleagues will say something about vocational education and the attainment gap, I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, our failure to meet the needs of those, particularly those in early and middle secondary schooling who become disengaged from the process. The consequences of this are enormous, um, both the social and the economic consequences. The consequences to the individual are pretty evident. Uh, educational failure tends to lead to a lifetime of unemployment uh, or at best insecure low paid employment by people who are otherwise in receipt of, of benefits. Um, but the damage to society in terms of lack of um, a potential, waste of potential, and uh, the expenditure involved in the things that I've just referred to is just as significant. Now, we have seen a lot of solutions attempted uh, to deal with the needs of this group, and many of them are out with the mainstream. And it is important that society should support these efforts. I would cite, for example, uh, the experience of Newlands Junior College, which uh, flourished for five years and achieved a quite remarkable degree of success with uh, hitherto disengaged young people on the south side of Glasgow who were predicted to fail in very large numbers, but who actually succeeded in very large numbers, who went into positive destinations and who were actively helped by the junior college to remain in those positive destinations. That received support from the Scottish Government, but ultimately was torpedoed by the indifference or hostility of Glasgow City Council. So there is an urgent need to be prepared to support that kind of endeavour and to be prepared to fund this kind of initiative, which means I think that funding has to follow the individual learner 
at this stage, rather than being lodged with the educational provider. The final area that I want to touch on relatively briefly has to do with data and research. Because one of the things that is most alarming about Scottish education, although certainly not one of the most headline grabbing, is the fact that we know remarkably little about what is going on. Indeed, it could be argued that we know less about how Scottish education is performing now than we did even 50 years ago. And in comparatively recent years, we have withdrawn from two of the three international surveys that we used to be part of. And the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy, which charted performance uh, at two stages in primary and one in early secondary, has similarly been wound up. A system which doesn't know how it is getting on lacks the capacity to improve itself. And so far from being an esoteric matter, this is a matter of central concern. For example, the funding which the government has provided on quite a substantial scale for trying to close the attainment gap, 750 million pounds or so over a five year period, is not accompanied by any uh, system of evaluation. We will not know at the end any more than we knew at the beginning about what is beneficial in these kind of circumstances. So just uh, to revert to you to where uh, I started, I said that we have a culture in Scottish education characterised uh, by complacency and compliance. It is now also characterised uh, by secrecy, defensiveness and dishonesty and the time for substantial change is now. Thank you very much, Keir. Uh, we're now going to move on to Professor Lindsay Patterson. Uh, Lindsay, we've been through what's been an extraordinary school year for pupils, parents and teachers, head teachers. Uh, we're still really working through the consequences of that educationally, socially, psychologically. This manifesto proposes a recovery plan, but I wonder if you could talk us through that. Yes, indeed. I, I don't suppose any of us really expected something like this to happen. The, the only previously similar extent of disruption to young people's learning was during the Second World War. And a, I can't say, I'm afraid that the government has responded or governing bodies have responded to this past year as imaginatively as they did in the period from 39 to 45. Teachers have responded imaginatively, and I'll come back to that in a second, and if so, especially have young people and their parents. The, the most immediate crisis, of course, still urgently before students today is what's happening to the exams this year. Uh, you know, we're, we're having this event in the context of an election campaign. The election campaign is debating lots of things, including lots of individual policies on education. But I doubt if anything, any of that is cutting through to the tens of thousands of young people who are faced with exams this week and next week and the week after, having been told by the government and the SQA that exams were going to be cancelled. And yet because of the instructions which the SQA has issued to teachers, teachers feel against their best judgment obliged to run prelim style exams to require students to do that without any exam leave and without any adequate preparation. It's difficult to imagine how we could have created a worse situation this year for the 15 to 18 year group than we managed last year, but we have. And yet none of our politicians have even raised the issue on the campaign trail. Maybe they will after today. That's the most urgent thing, but of course it has affected all students um, at school. I'll talk mainly about school. We can come on to universities and colleges perhaps later, but I'll focus on school here. The best estimate is that pupils have lost the equivalent of about half a year of schooling. Now that's bad enough in itself, but because learning is cumulative, that actually means that probably the majority of pupils have in effect lost a whole year of schooling. The reason for that is that as any teacher knows, every day you've got to spend at least 10 minutes going back over what was happening the day before. 
after the summer holiday, most teachers have to spend at least a fortnight going back over what was happening in June in order to get children just back to the point at which they departed at the end of June. So when you have the kind of interrupted schooling that we've had over the past year, then almost certainly there will be many, many thousands of children who've made literally no progress at all. Certainly research on this from the Netherlands, which has got much better data than Scotland has, as, as Keir mentioned, has shown that, um, that a, a, about half of children learned nothing nothing at all during the period of school closures in the Netherlands last spring and that was only two months compared with the equivalent of the five months that Scottish students have now lost. So probably some people have learned nothing at all in the past year and the majority have lost at least about a half of the year of schooling. Now of course the impact has been particularly on the socially disadvantaged. Um, Helen's going to talk a bit more deeply about the attainment gap, the poverty related attainment gap in a minute and of course that's the background of what then happened but people coming into this in poverty or in other kind of disadvantaged circumstances are those who have most suffered. And I, it, I probably don't need to rehearse the, the, the reasons for this, the lack of adequate internet connectivity, the lack of enough adequate devices, iPads and laptops and so on in the household, the competing demands on the broadband, the Wi-Fi in the household from several children and parents trying to work from home and so on and so forth. The fact that, of course, in general, all the reasons why we have social inequality in education were exacerbated in this past year because parents who could afford big houses and gardens and other kinds of things during the past year are exactly the same parents who can normally afford to give their children extra opportunities compared to parents who can't afford that. And that will have exacerbated this inequality in the past year. Research from the Educational Endowment Foundation, which um, it was based on the whole of the UK, so I can't see any reason why it wouldn't apply to Scotland. If you extrapolate that to this year and apply the lessons from England to Scotland, probably indicates that any social inequality, social class inequality, has probably risen by about 50% over the past year. Now, an increase of 50% in a year is about the same as the total increase of such inequality between primary one and primary seven in normal circumstances. A rough rule of thumb about total inequality in education is about two fifths of it happens before age five, about two fifths of it happens in secondary school and about one fifth of it happens in primary school. So going from two fifths to three fifths in one year is the same as going from two fifths to three fifths over seven years of primary. So we've managed to concentrate concertina, a whole primary school experience of inequality into just one year. Now, some, some young people will be able to catch up, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but it has to be bear in mind that some people are about to leave school and uh, probably already have left school. And research from the Sutton Trust uh, has tried to look at the long-term economic impact. So it looks as the most disadvantaged, that is young people who were already in disadvantaged circumstances uh, in, in their final year of school, and then who don't go on to university. And it has tried to forecast what the long-term economic impact on these people will be. And they estimate that by the age of 40, such people will be earning 4% less than they would otherwise have done. Now, if you do the calculations, that's the equivalent of an extra year and a half of unemployment uh, compared to, in addition to the unemployment risks that these people, low qualified early school leavers, already face. It's an accumulation of disadvantage that is going to take decades to recover from. So what is, have we been proposing? Well, in some ways we're trying to collate the, the, the best thinking about this, not just from Scotland, but indeed from, from throughout the UK and indeed further afield, because there are many people have been trying to think in a much more imaginative way about recovery from this process than it has to be said the Scottish government agencies have been doing. And I think there are three major things that we are proposing here, and I'll add a fourth one. Um, the, the first and most important thing, perhaps, is the introduction of targeted tutoring. There is excellent research that shows that a tutor working with a single student or with a very small group of students and working in partnership with the class teacher is the most effective way of enabling students to catch up with things that they have lost. It's a very effective thing. They're not freelance tutors, not tutors just doing things independently. It's tutors almost as classroom aides, but working outside the classroom. Some of that has been happening online in England through the National Tutoring Programme funded by the government there. Uh, but this is something that is needed here. That's very welcome to see that a few of the political parties have mentioning tut mentioned tutoring in their education manifestos. And this is something that could make a very big difference to the chances of some people that have fallen uh, behind. A second proposal is what we've called special classes. Um, and there are two forms of such classes which, um, which evidence shows, research evidence shows from elsewhere could work very well. One is 
uh, an extension and enrichment of homework clubs. Now, the, when we proposed this a few months ago, um, the uh, standard line was that we were proposing um, two hours of extra schoolwork every day. Uh, we weren't actually. What we were proposing was an extension of the concept of homework clubs that are already very successfully run in the independent sector uh, and also are run quite successfully in many schools facing where most of the children face disadvantaged circumstances and therefore don't have enough study space at home. So it's not for new teaching. It's not for starting at four o'clock in the afternoon and doing the same kind of things as a teacher would do with fresh young minds at nine o'clock in the morning. It's about sustaining the work of the school into the late afternoon in a way that is supported by professional staff. Now, of course, teachers are not obliged to do that. They might choose to do so, but this would be possibly recruited from student teachers, from retired teachers, from other people who would be suitably qualified and cleared in, in, in order to do that. And likewise, there is a, a good evidence in favour of summer schools. Again, sometimes to maintain the academic study over the summer. I mean, there's some research in the USA, by the way, which shows that the entire inequality that I mentioned a minute ago that arises during schooling um, actually happens during the summer when the children are not in school. Teachers are good at achieving equal outcomes when children are in their power, but they are useless. They can't do anything when the children have gone off in the summer. So that's where a summer school. Now, a summer school doesn't have to all be academic study. In fact, it would be far better if there was a mixture of these things, sustaining, for example, children's reading and numerical work, along with outdoor education, with music, with play, with a whole range of other kinds of um, stimulating activities. The third thing we I think is extremely important, this comes back to that very disadvantaged group, especially of people who leave school with few qualifications is developing a proper system of vocational education. I won't go into details of that, we can maybe talk about that, but above all, for example, it's about developing the system of apprenticeships. Um, Scotland's actually doing not too badly in apprenticeships. It's one of the few areas of educational success in the last few years, which oddly enough, the Scottish Government doesn't boast about. There we go. They, they've actually almost met their target of 30,000 modern apprenticeships. They've been developing a thing called foundation apprenticeships, which is a way in which, for example, young people um, who are a bit disaffected from academic uh, schooling can spend, say, a whole of a Friday in a neighbouring college and still be on the school roll. These are good ideas that need to be taken forward and become particularly important in reskilling young people for an economy that is whose 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 rate of change has been enormously accelerated by the economic consequences of COVID. Um, the, the other, the fourth thing I would add to that actually is relation, in fact, though, to the students who don't go straight into the labour market. That's who those who go to universities and colleges. Right at the moment, there is no official recognition either by government agencies or by universities themselves that there is an absolutely urgent need for students to catch up. There is a complete fiction and pretense going on in universities, including my own, that the students that we recruited last autumn and the ones we will recruit this coming autumn are as well prepared as they would have been in normal circumstances. Now, that is complete nonsense. And my colleagues um, I hear informally tell me that they have rarely encountered such a badly prepared group of young students. That is not the student's fault. It's not the teacher's fault. It's not the parent's fault. It's the fault of the circumstances. And we are not serving these young people well by not having programmes of catch up for new entrants to university and college. Final thing I would say here then is just to bring all this to a close and, and relate it to the wider question of the curriculum. This is more speculative and is, is something we might want to, to debate. All the research about what kind of curriculum work, what creates resilient uh, adults out of resilient young people, is a curriculum based on knowledge. And not by knowledge, I would hasten to add, I don't just mean facts, although facts are part of it. It's facts plus a conceptual framework and understanding of the facts that allows one to apply these ideas to new circumstances. That's what a successful education can do. Now, somewhere in the background of curriculum for excellence, there is the aspiration to do that. We are clearly, however, not doing it. So we're not providing our young people with knowledge, which is facts plus a conceptual framework to understand the facts and to apply them to new circumstances. By not having been doing that, we have probably uniquely ill-prepared young people for the crisis that they have just endured. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, and now, Helen Chambers. Um, Helen, we come up again and again against evidence that a, a, a one-size-fits-all comprehensive system isn't necessarily the best way to, to reach every child, especially those maybe whose talents lie in areas other than the big traditional school subjects, uh, and that's often linked to 
uh, disadvantaged background and, and the rest. We don't need to rehearse all the, the, the evidence that we've seen. I know at Inspiring Scotland, you work with disadvantaged young people daily and uh, vocational education is obviously therefore something that's close to your heart. So I thought perhaps you could talk us through your thoughts on that and also about the attainment gap, which is inevitably linked uh, and just what you see in you know the, the the people you the young people you work with and, and what you've come to view as the necessary steps to uh, to tackle that. Yeah, I think I probably want to sort of approach that slightly in reverse order, but link those three together. And what I want to talk about initially to, to sort of focus our minds in is about some very large numbers that are swishing around at the moment. If you look at unemployment claimants from 18 to 24 year olds, it's 40,000 currently. That's doubled in the last 12 months, probably pretty understandably, but it was already on a mild upward trajectory before that. We have another 40,000 children leaving school each year from the, the, the senior phase, and we have 90,000 young people aged um, 18 to 24 on the job retention scheme. So we're about to see a huge displacement effect as the job retention scheme comes to an end and that we're going to have an utter bottleneck of very literally tens of thousands of young people who are going to be unemployed. You could probably quite conservatively think that that's going to be 50 to 60,000 young people within the next 12 months that are going to be unemployed. We've always had a cohort, although the youth unemployment got down to about 20,000, we've always had a cohort of about 35,000 young people who are going to struggle. So if you think about what that spectrum is going to look like, the folk that are at the back of the queue already are going to be pushed way, way back. And as Lindsay and others have referred to, the impact of the last 12 months is going to be amplifying and compounding the struggles that they had anyway. And I think that what we're looking at there is that if you look at probably it takes about £2,000 within the voluntary sector to actually get those individuals to a positive destination, is that you're looking at probably about £100 million to actually start engaging with that. Now, there's been some very large investments in this space recently, but they're not at that scale. But there are some still even bigger numbers being bandied about and have been used with PEF, the Pupil, uh, Pupil Equity Fund, of 750 million. So it is within our reach to spend an amount of money that is accessible to the Scottish budget in avoiding, you know, we've talked previously about other recessions and elements about having a lost generation. Well, we're about, if we're not careful, to have a lost generation on steroids. And what we can't do is we can't have further inflow from school into that population whilst we're trying to assist that population. And if you look at what's happening to, to, to the kids that have always struggled, realistically, because of COVID and because of the point at which young people disengage from school, we're actually going to see quite a significant cohort that in reality left school at 14. Now, the age that that changed in Scotland of school leaving at 14 was 1901. So we're actually facing a completely different environment to one that we've previously had. Now, the other thing to reflect on is that there's been a couple of reports that have come out during COVID, and I think it's important that we don't miss them during looking at numbers that are all, you know, appropriately looking at health data. But we've had an Audit Scotland report come out in the last month about the impact on the attainment gap. And they very politely say that progression is inconsistent. What that actually means is that in a third of councils progression, it's actually got worse. The attainment gap has got worse. Of the remaining 19 councils, eight of them got additional funding and they've actually done OK with the uh, attainment challenge fund. So what we're actually looking at is that we spent £750 million to improve or the attainment gap in 11 councils. But we've only improved it marginally. If you look across all the data, we've uh, changed the rate um, in the lowest, uh, uh, in the most, sorry, the gap between the least and most deprived. We've moved from 45% to 36%. So we've had a five percentage point gap improvement on average for, that, for, the, for the attention that we've had in recent years. At that pace of change, it's going to take us 30 years, over 30 years to change that gap. And this data was mainly pre-COVID. 
And it's probably going to take us 5.4 billion pounds at that current spend rate to, to close the attainment gap. The inconsistency we're seeing, we're seeing with it, not just between the most deprived and the least deprived across Scotland, but we're seeing it within the cohorts of the most deprived. So East Dumbarton can get 71% of its most deprived cohorts getting five Nat Fives. East Lothian can only achieve 26%. So we've got a 50 percentage point difference between two local authorities that are not more than 70 miles apart. So what is going on there? And I think that we have had you know, evaluations of PETH, but I don't think we actually really do understand how to get the successes out of that kind of spend. If I was to be slightly rude about it, we've had a sort of a thousand flowers approach, a thousand flowers bloom approach, and that is really good with, with, with generating uh, innovation and giving people autonomy locally. But if you don't match that without being able to understand which one of those interventions really, really work, you have no help of scaling. The second report that's come out during COVID that I think is important to pay attention to, and I think one of the questions alludes to this, is Angela Morgan's review of ASL um, and the support for kids that need addiction support for learning. We're now at a rate where 31% of pupils qualify as needing additional support for learning. Now, some of that is that Scotland has a very broad and very generous definition of it. But however you define it, in recent years, we've seen a significant increase. And I think that what her recommendations are come back to and reflect the uh, CSR's view around, you know, I've listed them here, vision, Me measurement, integration into curriculum for excellence, leadership, audit, teacher development. And what she, 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 fin she finishes in her summary with saying, overall, the review has found that there are disconnects and contradictions between what is stated as intention and expectation and the misalignment of key processes at all the level of the system and the actual experience of children, young people, and their families and those who mo most closely work with them. And I think that we've really, really need to up our game now, is that we've got 30% of kids that are struggling for ASL reasons. They will form a great, enormous Venn diagram overlap with the attainment uh, issues. And we've got this huge population of young people who are gonna find it very, very tough in the world of work. So to come back to your question, Chris, is, so what? You know, I've outlined a, 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 a gloomy, disastrous set of figures. I think, as Kia said, we actually can intervene in really, really positive ways, but we need to look outside the school system. It's unfair to ask teachers and head teachers and the other support staff around schools to be able to deal with this level of intense need. And I think we need to look out certainly into the voluntary sector, but perhaps also into the private sector and actually take the interventions that we know work with the wraparound, holistic, person-centered care, family-centered care that are gonna enable these children to succeed. You know, part of the approach of the Newlands Academy was also represented in some of the work that Inspiring Scotland did over a decade where we got 35,000 young people into positive destinations with work through 20 voluntary sector organisations. So this is perfectly possible, but we need to spend the money in the right way across the right bodies, because actually we're not using all our firepower if we only set, sit our response in one sector. So I think it's absolutely critical that we get past the very, um, I think we need a reset in, in, in discussion of Scottish education. We have a, a sort of a set piece antagonism currently, where when anyone says anything, you can probably mit, mit, pretty much define where the dominoes are gonna fall to anyone else's responses. And I think we need to get past this. We actually need to use COVID as a reset and go, we have all been trying very, very hard, probably for two or three decades, but it's not worked enough. It's not to say it hasn't worked, but we are now going to face something at a scale that we've never faced before. And we have to do that in a multidisciplinary, collaborative and multi-sectoral way that we've in a way that we've never done before. And we, we really have to do this for, for, for our young people. 
Thank you, Helen. That's fascinating. Um, I'm just going to ask a, a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll open it up to the audience. So please do send in your questions uh, by message if you have them and I'll try and get to you. Um, I'd like to start, Keir, coming back to you on the curriculum for excellence because uh, obviously you were one of the early authors of the the project, we, we know that there's an OECD report that's sitting somewhere in a cupboard in John Swinney's office, which will not be released into the wilds until after this election. Um, what has gone wrong with Curriculum for Excellence uh, between the idea and the delivery that's now causing us so much trouble? It seems to be at the root of so much that we're, we're talking about today. What happened? You're muted, Keir. I would say that could take an awfully long time, Chris. The potted version. <laughs> I, I think the, the start of it going wrong was almost immediate. That there was no concerted attempt to communicate what were the important messages of curriculum for excellence or to engage with the profession uh, or the public uh, as to what difference it would make and how one might set about um, bringing them into, into practice. Uh, the result has been that a curriculum for excellence is whatever the person talking to you says it is. You know, if we gather together a large number, let's say, of, of key practitioners, such as head teachers, um, in a virtual room like this, asked each one to write a paragraph about what curriculum for excellence is, uh, we would then find out that there is a quite astonishing range of perceptions as to what curriculum for excellence is all about. And in those circumstances, um, the implementation programme was always headed for really serious difficulties. My feeling, and I'll be surprised if OECD doesn't say this, uh, is that it has suffered from a lack of strategic direction from the outset. Uh, various agencies and others have had a hand in implementation, but until comparatively recently, there has been no overall uh, direction of what, is, of what is taking place. Um, there has been, and this is in the realm of curriculum philosophy, great confusion about what kind of curriculum it's supposed to be. A lot of people think it's a skills-based curriculum, but actually it isn't really that, although there are elements of uh, skills-based approaches built into things like, for example, the experiences and outcomes. I mentioned earlier on the prodigious effort that has taken to get to the unsatisfactory condition that we're now in. I mean, the implementation programme was never designed with any eye to practicability at all, although that characterises a lot of this kind of thing within Scottish education. So uh, I'll stop there, Chris. There, there are any number of things that uh, have gone wrong and they tend, taken as a whole, to demonstrate a point that I made earlier on that we lack effective... <laughs> processes in Scottish education. We do not know how to bring about change in ways that don't make unreasonable demands on people and do achieve significant impact. Thank you, Keir. Um, Lindsay, coming to you, we talked about what an odd and, and unprecedented school year it, it, it's been. One of the consequences has been that we've moved from a, a system of independent examinations to more force on in-class judgments by teachers and more account being taken of coursework. And of course, this has led some to call for a more permanent transition to that, that model, um, arguing even that exams are an outmoded concept that fail to properly identify a child's abilities. Um, what's your response to that? Is, is there a genuine need to maybe rebalance the way we measure ability? How, how far is too far? That, that sort of thing. Well, we do. <clears throat> yeah, th there's been quite a lot of uh, jumping on bandwagons here. The bandwagon was started rolling, in fact, by by the, the Scottish Government's International Council of Education Advisors, who just before Christmas suggested that exams were a um, sort of Victorian technology that was out of date. In fact, of course, um, exams and coursework, as it tends to be called in Scotland, continuous assessment, have s separate strengths. Um, as assessment of coursework can, can assess investigatory skills, the capacity to debate findings, to think deeply about it and carefully about it. And you can't really do that so at all, really, through exams. But exams also test other things. They test alacrity. They 
test the capacity to work under pressure of time and in other ways. They test the capacity to focus, an enormously useful life skill if we have to talk about that. And they also test memory. Memory is actually very important. Um, some, the, 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 the renowned head teacher, Catherine Burble Singh um, of the Michaela Academy in London, who's, who's done more to equalize outcomes for a minority ethnic groups in London than any other person. She has made an important point here about exams, which she is in favour of. She says the real value of exams is not in the exam, but in the process of preparing for the exam. If you have to remember things and remember them in a way that can recall the knowledge quickly and apply it imaginatively and flexibly, then you will, re you will remember it very well in a way that you would never remember it if you had to study in other ways. Now, of course, what that then emphasises is the importance of well-designed exams, which we certainly don't have in Scotland. So the second thing, so the first thing I would say is that both of these things have a role to play. The second thing to say is that we have very badly designed exams at the moment. They are not, in fact, designed to test the things that I've just been saying they ought to test or can test alacrity and so on. In fact, they largely become rote memory exercises. So rote-like that actually very often in many subjects, children literally remember an entire essay and then just regurgitate it on the page when they're sitting in the exam room. The, the, the teachers are expected now to get children to almost learn by heart. Uh, there are many essays uh, to regurgitate in the exam. Now that's, that's an atrocious piece of pedagogy, not the teacher's fault, I would emphasize again here, but the fault of the circumstances that encourages them to produce that kind of thing. So no wonder people are becoming skeptical of exams if we are defining exams in that absolutely dire, uneducational sort of way. The final thing I would say about this too, of course, is that with the best will in the world, it's almost impossible to design a uh, a, a non-exam assessment which doesn't unfairly advantage children who have extra educational support at home. I mean, right at the moment, because of pressure and time in the school day, it, it, almost all the coursework that is normally assessed during a school year is taken home. Um, or children, can, if, if they can't take it home, they, they do it one day, they go home, they talk to their parents and, and so on about it, and then they go back and do more of it in school the next day. So there is an extra input from the home which is not available to other students. You could imagine a circumstance in which all of this kind of assessment was done in the classroom, but then it's in one day, but then it kind of almost defeats the point. Um, and as long as you're doing it over two days, then you've got this extra input, at least through conversation and possibly through drafts of essays and things uh, as well. So there is an element of unfairness built into coursework assessment, which is, is almost inescapable and therefore almost certainly coursework exacerbates inequality uh, to a greater extent than exams do. So I think a much more intelligent kind of assessment system is required, but we certainly don't have that uh, in Scotland at, at, at present. The teachers have risen to this challenge, but I have to say that their job has been extremely, they made it extremely difficult with SQA. I mentioned earlier on that they were being required in effect with SQA to run many exams in the face of the official denial that they had to run many exams. In other words, teachers are yet again being set up to be blamed for anything that goes wrong. The additional thing they did this year, which almost has been not commented on in public at all, is that when the SQA cancelled the exams at the instruction of John Swinney, they also cancelled most of the normal coursework. So, for example, in, in the higher sciences, you normally, I think it's about 20% of the total marks, go for a, a, a report that you write, usually on the basis of an experiment or fieldwork or something like that. So that has been abandoned this year. Similarly, in history, geography, modern study, and in most of the other um, subjects. So teachers who are very familiar with this coursework, the, the coursework assessment, were bereft of that. They couldn't fall back on their understanding developed over many years about, about what that coursework signified. And they were presented with new kinds of coursework that the SQA invented some roughly between about early December and late January. Um, so teachers' position has been made even worse this year than it was last year. So some of the students are in a worse position this year. Teachers trying to support and assess students um, have been faced with a far more difficult circumstance than last year, because last year they at least did have the normal coursework, most of which would have been finished by the time of the closures in March. OK, Lindsay, and just very quickly uh, back, back to you, Helen. We, we did an event not so long ago, I know, I know you were at it, um, looking at alternative education models and diversity of provision. and. You know, for, for, for me, certainly being exposed to what Newlands Junior Academy had done, Scran Academy, Cyrene and Centre Stage, what was extraordinary was this um, explosion of energy and commitment from, from people who were doing it because they believed in it. And almost the sense that they were doing it despite the government rather than with the government's support behind them, that, that, that they were somehow almost um, disapproved of by the establishment when actually you're, you're seeing this, you know, these alternative routes and paths that could be judged and developed and 
and found what, what why is why what's why is the Scottish education system so reluctant to embrace these alternative models as as additional ways of doing things rather than you know just sticking to the same thing for every pupil I think that is an awesome question and maybe that should be directed at, at head teachers and the educational establishment rather than me. I, th I think we're very territorially protective within Scotland and however much we've talked about removing silos, they are a very, very firm part of how Scotland works. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is the accountability systems and one of it are the budgetary systems. And because eventually what really, you know, really eventually counts in someone's job beyond whatever they get up for in the morning in order to assist people is how they are accountable for money and how they're accountable for whatever sits in their ambit. And I think that when you're accountable for that in a sole line, you then start to be very controlling of what happens with that. And you both want to look after the money that's invested and keep hold of it because you probably don't have enough. And also you want to control the pathway that, that, that comes to the outcome. And I think this sort of underlines my earlier point. Until we start to sort of break down some of those barriers and blend some of the edges, we're not going to succeed. And I think there are lots of examples all across Scotland about the inspiration and energy that you're talking about. And I think that Scotland, sometimes we're, we're, we're very good at berating ourselves. It's beyond tall poppy syndrome. We actually cut our own heads off, is that there are many, many things that have succeeded really well in Scotland over the last decade about actually increasing positive destinations from young people. There's been significant inputs from attainment agreements. You know, there's been the PEF money, however that may have been spent. Uh, the voluntary sector has put in large sums of money. The Scottish government's put in large sums of money and significant policy underpinning, and it worked. But we don't do enough of it, and we don't analyze what works and then scale. I mean, that's the, that's the accusation I would put to Scotland uh, across a whole range of areas is actually we learn what works, but we can, we don't bring it to scale. We get bored with the length of time it takes, and then we need we have the policy pendulum. You know we've all experienced this in our careers as we go over here and we do it for maybe up to three years or a bit less because everything's getting faster and faster. Or maybe I'm just getting older and older, and then we just come back again and we do the opposite. And actually, I think we need directions of travel rather this, than this endless you know, four legs, two good, two legs, bad, or whichever way around that is. And I think if you do look at the developments like um, the foundation apprenticeships, I mean, that, that's an excellent intervention, but it's three and a half thousand young people. I'm talking about tens of thousands, possibly hundreds, which I really hope not, um, that are going to struggle. You know, we, we've got pathway to apprenticeships, but we haven't tuned them enough, you know, um, foundation apprenticeships you actually have to have quite a high standard to be able to go into that and I think we actually need to look at these pathways for folk that are struggling from S2 and S3 and already drifting off and perhaps don't have the, the don't even have the bounce to get into the things that are supposed to help the people who are not succeeding so we have a lot of really great stuff in Scotland but it needs just a little bit more engineering a little bit more connecting and, and, and getting synergistic effects and then to be blunt upping our game adding adding tens if not you know at least one or two noughts at the end of the scale that we do and to capture exactly what you're talking about Chris because it's out there the inspiration the energy the ability is there but we need to do it enough to make a difference and for long enough to make a difference. Okay, thanks, Helen. Um, I'm just going to move into some questions from the audience now. There's a, a fair bit going on, but I'll just select some that seem to, to leap out. Um, I'll start with uh, Nick Kunzberg. Nick, what's that? Thanks, Chris. Um, that's been an astonishing uh, uh, analysis, which I think we're all probably reeling from. Um, one thing, Keir, you talked about uh, the necessity for innovation and the funding for innovation. I, I would just ask, is there enough innovation happening in the successful local authority schools? Uh, and you quoted Newlands and also in the private schools for us to be able to identify that innovation. So is it 
just the funding that's lacking? Are the idea are sufficient ideas there, as perhaps Helen was implying, and is it just the funding for implementing those? Always assuming that the various entities whom you slated were prepared to uh, recognize them and support. Right. Um, I think there's no question about uh, the need for easier access to funding, uh, but there's probably also a need for a greater diversity of ideas. There certainly is innovative thinking out there. Helen referred to uh, a number of bodies, mainly small charitable bodies, that have tried to meet the needs of uh, disadvantaged and disengaged learners. Um, but I think we need to look beyond that. We probably need to look beyond the shores of Scotland as well in order to uh, see what kind of innovative ideas are on offer elsewhere. Uh, you, you referred there to um, local, local authority schools which are successful and to independent schools. Um, I'm not sure that either of them is characterised particularly by innovation. Um, most of the most successful, if we are me measuring in terms of results now, I accept the fact that there are uh, significant objections to taking that as the sole measure of success. But if we're looking at local authority schools which are most successful in results terms, their success rests um, not only on their own efforts, but also on the fact that they're generally operating in socio-economically advantageous circumstances. And that, of course, is also true of um, the independent schools. The independent schools are an interesting example, however, in relation to um, response to the pandemic. Because on the face of it, with a large central agency, the public sector should actually have found it easier to make a quick response to the pandemic. Um, but it did not in fact do so. And the independent sector showed considerable agility um, in responding very quickly. And to give you just one example here, um, research by University College London uh, on the amount of online learning which young people were offered uh, compared the three devolved nations and the nine uh, English regions and also the independent sector. And one of its measures was those who were receiving uh, four hours or more of online lessons, something approximating to a slightly short uh, school day. And the answers to that uh, were Scotland, 3%, which was second bottom out of the 13. Uh, London, 12.5%, which was the best of uh, the state sector, and the independent sector, 31. Um, now, I'm not saying there was anything particularly innovative about uh, the uh, independent sector's response, but what it was, was enterprising and entrepreneurial and make, made use of the ideas that were out there. When I was talking, I was talking more about uh, ideas that require to be tried rather than gathered from existing experience. So yes, the funding element is very important, but I think we need also to be doing a lot of horizon scanning. Thank Thanks you. for that here. Uh, thanks, Nick. Um, Helen Robertson, we're ready for you, Helen. Thank you, thank you very much. It has been absolutely fascinating and it's great to be here. Great to hear so much uh, insight from so many um, well, well known um, figures within the industry. Uh, so my question was, and I suppose it was a statement as well, as you know, we are experiencing um, a rapid acceleration in digital education in every sense of the word. Um, so working within a digital learning industry, we see the adoption of um, digital learning in, in public, private and third sectors. And, um, and, and within some schools as well. So I was just really interested um, in the panel's views on um, what uh, do they see as imperative to the future of digital learning for schools, colleges and universities for the future? Thank you. Who would like to take that? Helen? 
I think obviously, you know, there's no way that we can work or walk away from the fact that this is going to be part of life going forward. But I think that we need to very carefully consider what happens within school and what happens outside school. And then the minute you have any requirements or needs to be able to undertake digital learning outside of a school environment, you are then going to really exacerbate the attainment gap in itself because you've got the issues of having the kit having the right uh, um, material on the kit, access to broadband, accesses to quiet spaces in order to, to, to do that, which is part of schoolwork anyway. But also, I mean, I think that, you know, and, and Scottish Government and others and the SCVO are already doing significant work on digital implementation, but it is more than just handing out iPads or laptops to, to school children. And I, I'm quite sure that we don't think that that's the be all and end all of it. But I think that we have to be very, very careful that we don't go down a path that helps us in one direction and kicks out the legs out from underneath us on another policy aspiration. Because I think we've learned in the last 12 months that there's a great deal of finesse and sophistication about actually getting digital into the communities that perhaps need it the most. So it's gonna be an immense boost if we use it right, but we have to make sure that that's a fair boost. Thanks, Helen. Well, we're, we're getting uh, close to, well, we're actually beyond deadline, but we'll keep going for another few minutes. Um, I've got a question for you. I think, Lindsay, you'd be best placed to answer this. It's from Claire McGill, who I think has had to go to another meeting, but she asks, uh, she'd like to hear more about what data and evidence you think needs to be gathered by the Scottish Government and others in order to plug the current evidence gaps. I know this is something that bothers you intensely, mm. and, and that famous quote that you came out with about, we know less about what's going on inside Scotland schools than we have at any time since the, the 1950s. So we're talking about potentially setting up a, 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 an education equivalent of the Office of National Statistics that would have a laser-like focus on gathering data, analysing it, and just telling us what's going on inside the education system. What, how, how would you see that working? What would be the kind of key data points? Yeah. That <clears throat> I mean, there's, it, it's true. I, I noticed that I think somebody replied to Claire saying, well, we've got lots of data that's just not adequately marshaled. And, and, and that is part of the reply, undoubtedly. There's lots of data that is just not collated and is not made available for independent analysis. So that's, that's the first thing. But there's more fundamental than that, because simply stacking up a whole lot of data and the number of passes at National 5 or the number of people who stay on beyond the leaving age is, is important, but it's, it's, it's not nearly enough to understand, to begin to understand the ways in which these outcomes come about. In other words, you really ideally, the ideal, let me say what the ideal data setup would be, which is obviously impossible because it's totally unaffordable. We would every three or four years, we would take a birth cohort, children born this year, for example, and follow them through like the marvellous Growing Up in Scotland survey has been doing for a cohort born in 2002. You would follow them through every two years or so and you would track their progress through schooling and then into higher education or the labour market or whatever it is that goes beyond that. Now that would be unaffordable because it is massively expensive, but that's the, if we take that as the ideal type, which would allow, oh, and I should by the way say I'm, I'm obviously rather biased towards using statistics here, but you can add on to that all sorts of qualitative data in focus groups and interviews and a more imaginative ways of getting responses from young people, for example, getting them to write little essays about themselves, not just fill in questionnaires. So all of that can be done, but at an enormous price that nobody could really afford. So to substitute for that, <clears throat> there are various compromises that we could make and still get some of that out of it. One model we should take is England. I mean, Scotland really ought to learn from England, it should be said here. England has got a thing called the National Pupil Database, which more or less does what I've just described for every year. It tracks children from age three, I think it is, right through, and it very soon is going to be linked into their college and university destinations as well. So you can follow a child <clears throat> going right through the system, their, their national tests, their GCSEs, their A-levels, and then beyond that as well. The, the, that's great. And there's been some really, really good research done on that to understand what succeeds, what doesn't, what reduces the attainment gap, what doesn't, what empowers teachers, what doesn't, and so on and so forth. The problem is that it's primarily an administrative database. <clears throat> Most of the information there is the kind of stuff that is routinely collected as part of the school census or as part of the examination system. Now that's necessary but not sufficient. We need a lot more, for example, about social circumstances. Uh, one of the if you look at the, you know, this is going to be controversial, I've just realised, if you look at the research in, on education in the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, um, it would be done by Professor Stephen Strand, 
Um, I don't know whether this is whether his his research is approved of or not, but I'm going to approve of it because it's extremely good research. But he couldn't do it using that. He had to use a longitudinal survey that collected details on people's ethnicity and their social circumstances and their parental characteristics, as well as all the other things that I've just mentioned. And he would have liked to have used the National Pupil Database, but unfortunately, the the data the, there wasn't sufficiently rich data on ethnic diversity to allow him to investigate ethnic you know whether there was ethnic inequality. In in, in progress during schooling. Um, so we, we need we need something like that, but with additional data on the social and cultural circumstances that, that, that people face. Now, because, however, the core of that is already available administratively as in England, it's available from the SQA, it's available from the annual school census, both on the pupils and the teachers, it's available from actually other agencies that we can link in, such as the um, the, the, the NHS, if you want to look at people's health conditions, and it should, if the, S, if the SNP are committed to the new Scottish National Standardised Assessments, which they don't mention in their manifesto, so I'm beginning to doubt that they are, but if they are, then it will soon be available for testing children um, right from mid-primary right through to their, their SQA exams. Now, that would be an enormous step forward, and if we could just put in place in Scotland what they have in England, but enhance it with some extra information about social circumstances, including ethnicity, then I think we would take an enormous step forward. It would be expensive, but not in not formidably expensive, precisely because most of it is a matter of linking together different administrative databases. Thank you very much, Lindsay. That was, that was fascinating. And um, we'll have to leave it there, sadly. I'd like to thank today's panel, Keir, Lindsay and Helen. And I, I hope you found this a stimulating conversation and it's, it's given you plenty food for thought. Every time I sit around the Commission on School Reform table, I leave with my head reeling from the insights and, um, and ambitions that, that you see there. I think the truth is that we have to keep standing up for these ideas if we're ever going to make a difference. There's a real, undoubtedly, a poverty of ambition in the Scottish education system, which lets down children, their parents, teachers, and I think the, the, the more broadly the country itself. Um, I'd also like to thank the Scottish Policy Foundation, whose support has made this research and, and these events possible. We've got one final joint policy venture on Monday before the election, and we'll be looking at the renewable energy opportunity facing Scotland from hydrogen to wave and wind power to carbon capture. Uh, and I promise you what I've seen of this so far, it's going to be utterly engrossing. There are some amazing things going on uh, out and about there and some, some incredible opportunities for the Scottish economy. That's at 2pm on Monday, and you should have an invite, invite in your email. If not, and you'd like to attend, please email events at reformscotland.com. And then that's Monday. On Tuesday, we have Nicola Sturgeon. So I'll be interviewing the First Minister ahead of the Holyrood election. Again, if you don't have an invite, do email events at reformscotland.com. So uh, thank you once again to everyone for coming. And uh, I'm sure we'll see many of you next week. Uh, and all the best.